Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirt bags and hiker trash. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, Take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. Well, buckle up, constant listeners, because this week we are talking to an avid backcountry pooper, a senior product designer at Outside, a Forest Service volunteer ranger, and the chief excretory officer of How to Poop in the Woods, Julia Wren. This is going to be a craptastic episode. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod, Julia. How's it going? Thank you. I'm doing pretty well. What did you think of that intro? That's phenomenal. I should have thrown in there that, that Julia is also a sporadic listener to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. And I appreciate that. I love it. I'll take regular listeners. I'll take sporadic listeners. I'll take the occasional listener. I'm becoming a regular listener, so I've nice. leveled up. <laughs> leveled up. I, like, I love that. Uh, do you have a favorite episode that you've listened to recently? I do actually. Um, I absolutely love the episode with, um, I'm forgetting her last name, but it's Christine, the author of Alone in Wonderland. Um, She actually lives just north of me in Boulder and she's a member of a writing group that I'm part of. She's phenomenal. So it was awesome to get to hear you talking to her. Christine Reed. She was a lot of fun to talk to. And you are, you are just outside of Boulder or in Boulder? I'm in Golden. So I'm about 30 minutes outside of Boulder. That's where they make cores, right? It is. Yes. I can Golden almost Colorado. I know, I know my, my beer, my beer, uh, uh, label manufacturing sites. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now what was the temperature in Boulder today or in golden today? It was 91. It's still like in the high eighties. So yeah. Downright balmy. Balmy. Yeah. It was, it was triple digits in Southern California today. So I'm, I'm a little envious. Yeah. All right. Hey, Julie, have you picked up a trail name along the way? I have actually, I was thinking about this. I've had a couple. Um, so I think when I was in Canada hiking, they called me Colorado. When I was in Chile, I was sparkly boots because I hopped off a plane with a pair of pristine purple and pink loas. Uh, but the one that has stuck the longest is Jax. Jax. And what is the story behind Jax? So I got it um, from running uh, trail friends versus backpacking. I, I got the name way before I started backpacking. Uh, when I moved to Colorado, I was 24 and I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a job. My partner at the time uh, was playing in a sport and social league and his team needed a female to fill out their team. Otherwise they were going to have to forfeit. Um, And I had never been athletic. I was very clumsy growing up. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, But I figured that anything had to be better than their team forfeiting. So I joined his ultimate Frisbee team and I met the group of people who were going to become my Colorado family. Um, And so in ultimate Frisbee, You do a lot of running, and if you have no hand-eye coordination, running is really the only way that you can contribute to the team. So growing up, I'd always hated it. I had asthma, and I was constantly short of breath, so it was just not my thing. Um, But this team was so patient and super friendly that I ended up training for a 5K with them, and then that turned into running the Boulder Boulder, which is a huge 10K up in Boulder that they do every year. Um, And then I did a half marathon. We did Ragnar relays, which are like 200 mile overnight relays where you have a team of 12 that run each run a leg of the race. Um, And then we started doing adventure races. And on one of those longer races, we were hanging out in the van and we were giving each other nicknames. And uh, my roommate at the time was one of our teammates and her partner was calling her Marbles. And so my partner looked at me and said, well, if she's Marbles, then you're Jax. And so that's just, that's been it for years now. Marbles and Jacks. That that story took a lot of turns. And I, I love that when a story goes a direction that I, I was not expecting. So I was expecting some kind of story related to Ultimate Frisbee. And this morphed into a tale of how you went from Ultimate Frisbee to becoming a runner that you, you didn't previously care to do. It's crazy. In my life in Colorado, I think everything literally everything tracks back to that ultimate Frisbee team. I got my first job from one of my teammates. I met my partner through, you know, someone else who was on the team, like my hiking, I never would have gotten into backpacking had it not been for that team. 
So I think really everything tracks back to just a phenomenal first group of friends. And tell us a little bit about Ultimate Frisbee. How does it work? What, what is the premise behind Ultimate Frisbee? This is a branch of the outdoor adventure lifestyle that we've not previously explored. So we're always, yeah. always interested to, to take a little detour. So it's kind of like flag football in that you are trying to move the Frisbee into an end zone or maybe like a weird version of soccer that's not using your feet. Um, so instead of throwing a ball, you're passing a Frisbee. Um, but, you know, we had, it was a sport and social league. So of course there's drinking involved and the more you're drinking, the more of a contact sport it becomes. So we had torn ACLs. We had a uh, finger that was like, had a compound fracture and a bone sticking out of it. We had all sorts of really exciting injuries that were just like ridiculous for a recess sport. So I guess there's some good and there's some bad to the drinking. I mean, the drinking it gets a little out of control, but I imagine that the pain is a little bit numbed if you've had a few. That's probably true. Right? It's a, it, yeah. it, it works both ways there. I did learn. My ultimate time uh, taught me that, which is a lesson that I've carried through to backpacking, that you really never leave your house without a first aid kit because you should expect someone to get injured at some point in any kind of you know outdoor pursuit. I love, I love it when we can apply lessons learned in other areas of our lives to backpacking. I mean, it's, it, it, all, it all comes together that way. It really does. Nice. Now, adventure racing, we, we have talked about on the podcast before. I don't know if you've heard the episodes with, I had an episode with Brett Gravelin. Yeah. That, that, was, that was one of my favorite episodes because just his, his, his story of the eco challenge. That's phenomenal. And the way it ended, it was just, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to do a spoiler here, but uh, it, it was quite a story. And then somebody else that was in the Eco Challenge on a different team, Hunter Leininger, mm -hmm. Leininger, I think it is. Uh, he also came on the podcast and talked about, about his adventures. And, and adventure racing is a variety of disciplines combined into the, the same race. And so there could be kayaking, there could be running, there could be cycling, um, just a, a whole host of different types of disciplines. And you have to, you have to certify in a number of areas before you're able to actually. You do uh, if you're hardcore. Oh, it is. It is. Ours very are very low key. We started organizing them with our group of friends because we got kind of sick of the, like the organized overnight relays. They just weren't quite fitting the bill. So we started taking our whole group and going to some destination in like Utah. We've done a bunch in the Pacific Northwest and just, you know, we'll do running, we'll do kayaking. I'm trying to put together a course where we go from the Northern end of golden by our house all the way to the Southern end. And it's all human powered movement. And we hit all of the peaks along the way. So that's a little bit more our speed. Okay. And you are creating, creating these or you're entering uh, events hosted by other people. That one I'm creating right now because wow. I'm rehabbing an ACL injury. So I really have nothing else to do. And I also occasionally work on mapping software at work. So it's a really nice, a nice proof of concept for some of the work that I'm doing. Okay. And now uh, of the events, the adventure racing events that you've participated in, do you have a, a favorite and you can kind of share the different disciplines that you went through in that, that particular race? We've only done, as far as adventure racing goes, we've really only done the ones that we've put on ourselves where we'll, you know, just pick a destination, go camp and run from that destination. We'll hike. Um, we've had some friends mountain bike. I personally have not partaken because I'm way too clumsy for that. Okay. Now, Michael Wardian also, when he was a guest on the podcast, he, he shared his concept that he came up with of state-a-thons where yeah. he would go the, the width or, or length of a state uh, using just human power. So it could be running, cycling, swimming, kayaking, whatever, but uh, that'd be his own personal challenge. He wasn't racing against anybody, but, but himself. That's, I love that piece of it. Yeah. We have a similar, not at all across the state, but we have the skyline traverse in Boulder, which is the five peaks next to town. And there's something that I just absolutely love about being close to town, you're paralleling a road, but you're having this totally separate experience. You feel like you're in the wilderness, you're in the mountains all day, and you are, you know, at any given time, like 30 minutes from a brewery. And it's just so much fun. Yeah. And it's just such an affirming way to get to know the place that you're living in. That's my kind of adventuring. You're out there getting after it, but you're only 30 minutes away from a brewery. Nice. Yep. Okay. Well, Jax, you, you have listened to the, the podcast before, so you are familiar with the segment that we have towards the end of the episode called the Pro Tip Inside of the Week. So I will turn to you and ask you to share some trail wisdom to make our listeners' next outdoor experience even better. So 
I'm sure you're expecting that. Sounds good. Okay. The must bring gear review. All right. Another feature we've been doing this season is the must bring gear review sponsored by the ultralight backpacking gear company, six moon designs. And here's how it works. If you were to let a stranger pack your back with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day hike, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So Jax, what is your must bring piece of gear? That's a good question. I've been thinking about that. And I think that for me, it has to be my raincoat. Uh, I have a Marmot preset, but I'm not like married to that brand for any reason. It's just the one that I got at my first REI garage sale. And it's, you know, it's stuck with me for 10 years. Um, but I carry it everywhere. Like I take it on trail runs. I take it on hikes. I have it shoved in the bottom of my purse when I, you know, go out for dinner. Like it comes everywhere with me. And I think there are very few problems that can't be solved by a raincoat. So, you know, like if I'm on a summit hike, I'm wearing it as a windbreaker. I cover my legs with it when I kayak and I'm getting sunburnt. Of course, it's nice to have if it rains. Um, but my one rule is that it has to have pit zips because otherwise I'm going to cook when I'm inside. Okay. Now you say you're not married to that particular brand, but does it work pretty well for you? I've loved it. Yeah. It's, I had, I've had a couple other brands throughout the years. Like I've tried to get lighter weight ones because mine is fairly heavy. Um, and so I, you know, I want one that's maybe lighter or packs down better one that's better for running. Like you can always optimize, but I love this guy because when I'm stuck in, you know, a horrible, we have these crazy hailstorms at like four in the afternoon in Colorado. And when those come up, it has a nice little visor that the rain and the hail just kind of roll off of. I'm always dry. It doesn't flake. It's, I love it. Yeah. I'm always looking for a, a rain shell of some sort, because mm -hmm. I always feel like the ones I have. Are, are just not doing it for me. I probably have three or four different ones out there off brand looking for, for some kind mm -hmm. of solution. And I'm just not totally satisfied. So I, my ears always perk up when I hear, when we talk about maybe a possible rain shell option out there. Yeah. We've had others come through our house and I'll admit I, this one's not my favorite for running. Um, but I'm frequently like more likely to just run in the rain than putting on a raincoat. Um, but for multi-day trips, especially, I love this guy. I'll put it on when I'm in my sleeping bag and I'm cold and I just need an extra layer. Like it's, it's wonderful. Now, again, I'm, I'm a little bit tickled that you are not a runner. You had asthma and then you played ultimate Frisbee and somehow you become this, this avid runner. I mean, how many, what, what is your, what is your normal mileage during a week? My normal mileage used to be somewhere between 20 and 40 miles a week, but right now I'm not doing any running because of my ACL. So that's really hard. I'm riding the stationary bike and I'm kayaking and I'm walking. My PT has been very specific that I can walk on level concrete trails, but anything that, you know, has a bunch of elevation change or has any unevenness that's considered hiking. And that's a sport and I am not allowed to do that. So that's been really challenging. So frustrating to reach yeah. a level of fitness where you're running between 20 to 40 miles a week and then something happens and you, you, you're not allowed to do that. You can just, you can feel the physical fitness just kind of draining from your body and you do. Yeah, losing it's rough. that stamina. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. I, I, I have a little mountain behind my house. And I, so I sit here and look at it all day while I'm working and I can't climb up it. And it's very sad. Heartbreaking. I ran a marathon in October. I uh, nice. did a PR for me. I was probably in the best shape of my life in my fifties. And uh, then in December I pulled, I don't know, I pulled or I tore my left hamstring. It's just been oh. miserable getting back. And, it, you know, I just, you know, the same exact thing, You're just feeling that, that level of fitness seeping out of your body. It's just so yep. frustrating. How did, how did you, how did you hurt your, your, is it ACL or MCL? It's, I did both. Oh. Um, I did my MCL, my ACL and my meniscus. Uh, the MCL I did 10 years ago. Um, it had a lot of scar tissue build up from healing. I did that skiing. And then my ACL and my meniscus, it's so stupid. I had just gotten back from backpacking in Havasu and I went to uh, a campground in Nebraska with my goddaughter. She was two and we were playing on a trampoline and I did some like crazy cheerleader jump and came down wrong and just tore the whole thing. Oh, trampoline, yep. a trampoline accident. Yeah. At a campground. So with a two-year-old. So yeah, that's you, my epic story. Were you a cheerleader in high school? No. No, I was a dancer. Kindle, I, I did Kindle, ballet. Old, old memories. Yeah. No, I was a ballerina. So I was like, I can do this. I'm still flexible. But no, I'm I'm in my 30s. I can't do that shit anymore. <laughs> it's tough realizing when 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 you have the realization that, oh my God, I'm officially old. Uh-huh. 
and you don't heal like you used to like suddenly you know a fall on a trampoline equals surgery and nine months off oh you had you had to have it surgically repaired i did yeah i had surgery in february okay we're recording this in mid-june basically yep. so yep. We're, we're four months out from the surgery how much longer do you have to go do you think Um, they said that they're going to make me wait the full nine months, uh, until I'm allowed to like, until I'm allowed to do anything at full capacity, but hopefully I'll be jogging soon. I just got cleared for the elliptical. I'm hoping to get on the outdoor bike soon. So yeah, progress, very slow progress. All right. But I don't think any backpacking for me this summer. Ah, heartbreaking. Yeah. All right. It's the hiking pole. All right, half calf, reminding us that it's now time for the hiking pole. That's P O L L, not P O L E. This is a seven question survey. It's going to help me determine uh, how sane you are. And if you've been listening to, if you've been an occasional listener, a sporadic listener of the podcast, you'll you you will have heard the hiking pole before. But I've changed things up, Jax. I've changed the questions. All right. These questions, in fact, have nothing to do with hiking. Okay. These are the big issues in our world right now. Ooh. Okay. So I've got seven questions for you. These are the, the big issues of the moment. We're gonna, we, we can spend a, probably an entire episode on each of these questions. Okay. But uh, we're going we're gonna to get your take, which side of the fence you fall on each of these. And then I'm going to give you a score. Okay. Between one and 100. All right. 100, you're completely saying nobody has ever got that before. Yeah, one, I'm doubting. One, you're completely bonkers. Nobody's gotten that score either. But uh, w- which side? Which side of the scale do you think you you lean to? Are you more on the sane side or more on the bonker side? I mean, I have a website about poop, so <laughs> that Fair probably point. doesn't bode well. Fair point. This this could be a sub fifty. All right, you ready for the first question here? Bring it. Okay. Do you? This is and again. This has nothing to do with hiking. This is in okay. your your real real world life. Okay. As you sit on your porch and you look at that mountain with longing in your eyes, do you sleep with your socks on? No. No. Who does she, that? She I mean, not unless I'm camping. There. Say that again. Not unless I'm camping. Right. Yeah, it's acceptable camping. Yeah. But yeah. in in normal life, no socks. No. Okay. No. No major point deduction as of yet. Excellent. Okay. Two. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Oh, yes, definitely. Oh, emphatically. Oh, yeah. This is a constant source of conflict with our friends. Like every time we order pizzas as a group, I've got pineapples on that bad boy and they get so upset. But I feel very strongly. And when did, when did you first decide that this was a possibility? Mm. It had to be before college because my best friend in college was from, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania and he was from just a couple hours away from me. And we were the only two, we'd get like the $5 deal from Domino's where you can get five pizzas for $5. And he was the only one who would share the pineapple pizza with me. Pennsylvania. I'm surprised. I'm, I'm surprised because I you know Southern California, I could see this being a, a thing. Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. I didn't get the pineapple on a pizza vibe from the state of Pennsylvania. I don't know. I love it. Okay. All right. Question number three. Do you roll your toilet paper over or under? Oh, these are good questions. These definitely tell you, I, these should have been like questions on a dating app. It's over. It's definitely over. And my husband goes under. And if he happens to be the one who put the toilet paper on the roll, I will flip it so that it is correct. Okay. You yeah, will, yeah. Sounds like you will die on that hill. That, that yeah. you are dead set. It is definitely over and not under. Yes, definitely. Why is it? What is, what is the reasoning behind that? It's just ergonomics. If it's underneath, it can get stuck. It's a lot harder to get like a good roll. Although I will say my dog has a propensity now to go. And if it's over, he can pull on it and, and get the whole paper to flow out, which is not ideal. So we might have to shift it up now that we've got a puppy in the house. Surprisingly, you're not the first person to, to mention the, the involvement of a pet uh-huh. uh, and, and the pet has better access if it's over, but er- yeah, I love yeah. the fact that you used ergonomics. I mean, it sounds, sounds like a very scientific word. Uh, like you, I'm a you UX designer, so it's all about usability, right? Like mm-hmm. it's form over function mm-hmm. or form follows function. So yeah, if it's, if it's looking good, but it's not working, it, it doesn't matter. So it's got to be over. 
yeah, none of this gets stuck stuff when you're pulling on it. All right, follow up question on this particular one. This is not one of the seven. This is just a follow up. If you're at a friend's house or a family mm -hmm. member's house and you're you're sitting on the throne and you you, you look that. over and you realize that oh my gosh they've got it under, do you take the time to correct that situation? So my boss once had us over to his house for dinner and I fixed his. So I'm committed. 100% committed. I, I love somebody who's committed. There's no waffle here. You are yep. all in on this. I believe that we are here to make the world a better place. And this is my contribution. One roll at a time. Yep. Okay. Oh, and I think there's a toilet paper roll in my logo. And I do believe I might be wrong, but I do believe that it is over. Oh, yes, it is. Excellent. <sighs> You know, I just, I just I realized really I'm, nervous talking, for a second. I'm talking to an expert in the field. This is, this is outstanding. We have the, we have the definitive answer here. All right. Question number four, there are these pictures with uh, a bit of video in them and they're, they're spelled G I F. How do you pronounce that? I believe some pronounce it GIF. No, it's definitely GIF. Definitely GIF. Mm-hmm. I should have actually an academic answer for this because I went to school for graphic design and like the creator, I think might have pronounced it GIF. I don't remember which way it was originally pronounced and I really should because that's like a you know professional piece of knowledge that I should have, but I feel very strongly about GIF and I will, yeah, I will make a stand about that anytime I'm asked. You know what? I'm just, I, I got this big smile on my face because you're, you're committed on each of these answers. There's, there's no oh, yeah. wavering. You have a strong opinion. And I like that. I do. Okay. Next question. Question number five, cats or dogs? Hmm. I have had a cat for 14 years and I love her. She's been with me longer than any man, any car, any house, then longer than backpacking. Uh, but I've had a puppy for five months and he's amazing. So I'll say anything furry that likes me back. Okay. Okay. You're not, you're not going to pick on this one. You, anything furry that loves you back. Yeah. You, your cat, your cat and you are committed to each other. 14 we years. Mm -hmm. And I like that, you know, longer than, than any relationship you've ever had with, with, yep. uh, with a guy. So, yep. all right. What kind of cat? She's a Maine Coon. So she's very large and fluffy and has quite a personality. And what kind of dog? Uh, he's an Aussie doodle. An Aussie doodle. Yeah. I love Australian shepherds and border collies, but they're both herding dogs and we've had the cat. So I wanted to maybe temper that a little bit and he's great. Like he doesn't try to herd her. He's terrified of her actually. So it works out really well. And those dogs have a lot of energy. They need a they lot do. of exercise. Yes. He's possibly the most like empathetic, sweet dog I've ever met. So I was sick a couple of weeks ago and he just, you know, he's a puppy. So he's got twice as much energy as a normal dog. And he would come and curl up on the couch with me and just like, you know, he tried, he had a lot of energy. So he'd sprint around the house and then he'd come back and curl up on the couch with me and be like, I'm sorry, I'm here. It's very sweet. <laughs> and what, what are the names of your, your fur babies there? My cat is Micah and the dog is Riley. Micah and Riley. Okay. Yep. All right. Question number six. Do you use the Oxford comma? I do. Yes. Because it just, it removes ambiguity. Do you want There's to a really great meme about why you should use the Oxford comma involving like Nazi strippers and things like that. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. And I recommend looking up why you should use the Oxford comma because people have come up with some really great sentences that get really weird if you don't have it. Okay. <laughs> for, for clarity and to avoid ambiguity. And for our listeners out there who are scratching their heads, uh, thought they were tuning into a, a hiking podcast, an outdoor adventure podcast, and, and then now we're, they're, they're confronted with this concept of the Oxford comma. How would you explain the Oxford comma to those listeners? It's that extra comma that goes at the end of a series. So you could talk about having like, I don't know, you have a horse, a book and an orange. And, you know, it would go in between the book and the orange. And it's, do you want to have a comma there or do you not? And I, I strongly believe that the comma belongs there. 
Yeah, there's a, 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 a portion of the country, portion of the world, I guess, that would argue that, you know, the and is enough of a separator between those, the last two items in a series. And in journalism, I think they really don't believe in the Oxford comma, which makes it kind of awkward because I work for a publishing company and, but I, I feel very strongly. You know, since they've made that decision not to use the Oxford comma, the world is going to hell. I, I don't disagree. I think there's definitely a correlation there. Yeah. All right. Final question. Big question here. All right. In fact, we, we could probably, probably spend a couple of episodes on this one alone. Is the hot dog a sandwich? Ooh, that is a good question. I'm vegetarian, so the hot dog is just kind of a non-issue in my house. But I do believe that you can't you can't get out of this question by claiming vegetarian status. True. I, I do believe that a taco is an open faced sandwich and a pizza is basically a cooked taco. So, you know, I think we could get all of this back to sandwich. Wow, that is radical. A taco. Explain to me the taco concept. I mean, what's an open face sandwich? You've got like your your grain on the bottom and then you've got your toppings on top of it. And, you know, it may have melted cheese on it. That's basically a taco. But, but it's, not open. it's not open. I mean, there's, there's an opening, but there's, there's stuff on either side. I mean, I guess that it even strengthens the argument, right? That it's, yeah. it's a sandwich of some sort. Yeah, yeah an open face sandwich. I mean, if you fold it in half, then it's definitely a sandwich. If there's a hinge... Like on, you know, a taco, the end, the, the end of a taco or yeah. a hot dog bun. If there's a hinge, does that make any difference? I mean, I think that just means you didn't cut the bread all the way. <laughs> I'm not a sandwich. Well, is a hoagie a sandwich? It is. Yeah. So then, then you got to give it to the hot dog because there's a hinge on, on a hoagie roll. Okay. All right. These are all valid points. Valid points. And uh, let me do some quick math. And here I was prepared to talk about cold soaking. Yeah. Well, oh, hey, okay. Bonus question. When you're, when you're out on the trail on a multi-day hike, uh, is it stove, cold soaking, or oh, what's the third option? Um, Stoveless. Stoveless. Thank you. I am all about, um, I, normally I'll take a stove. I love like my coffee. I love my hot dinner. I do like an emergency tea before I go to bed. Um, but I do cold soak being a vegetarian, it's really hard to get enough protein for lunch. Um, so I cold soak hummus and beans that I dehydrate at home. And then I will take that for lunches and that's pretty phenomenal on a tortilla, which I do qualify as a sandwich. Jack, you were doing so well until I asked that follow-up <laughs> bonus question there. Let me do some quick math here. We're going to, uh, gonna carry the, carry the two get divide by pi and multiply that by the, the, the root of three. And we're going to adjust for the altitude of uh, some of the 14ers out there in Colorado. And I come up with a solid score of 93 for you. Uh, you're one of the, one of the saner people, even though, even though the top, the title of this episode is how to poop in the woods. And that's going to be a big topic tonight. Uh, you are a, a 93. So congratulations. Thank you. I feel very honored. It's, 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 you know, the score is based on how much I agree with your answers. It's also it's all subjective. It's it's the world according to the doc. In fact, that might be a follow up uh, splinter uh, podcast. The world according to doc. We could talk about all kinds of things. You got your spinoff. Yeah. Would anybody listen to that? I think so. Yeah. Oh, there's an audience for everything. <laughs> all right. Before we get to the the spinoff, uh, the world according to doc. Uh, let's back up a little bit and talk about your background, where you grew up sports and hobbies uh, when you were younger, and how you got involved in the, the hiking cult. Yeah, so we've kind of talked about the fact that I was not a super athletic child growing up. I was a dancer, but ballet does not require hand-eye coordination. Um, and I, I was also a really cautious kid. Like I grew up in a house, my dad's a judge, so there, there was a lot of judgment in the house. Uh, and I was really, I developed this deep-seated understanding really that you shouldn't try anything new unless you're going to be perfect at it the first time you try it. So needless to say, I did not try very many things, um, but I had a really adventurous heart. And so I kind of quenched my thirst for adventure by reading. I was a very nerdy child. Um, so I read a lot of like Swiss Family Robinson and Boxcar Children and My Side of the Mountain and Far Side of the Mountain, where a kid runs away from his family and lives in the woods in a tree in New York um, in the Adirondacks. I loved a walk in the woods 
um, and just a ton of books like that. And, you know, anywhere where there was a character who was away from modern society, like living off the land or hiking long distances. And I idolized those characters. But like, for me, that was not an attainable lifestyle. They were just characters. I didn't think that I could ever live in the wilderness or climb mountains or through hike. Um, and then I moved to Colorado in my 20s. I had my dream job. I was working for Pennsylvania Ballet in Philly. And I came out here for a wedding. And once I came to Colorado and realized that this could be my life, I left Philly immediately, quit my job. Um, and I was lucky enough to find those friends that were on my ultimate Frisbee team. Um, and they really taught me that I was capable of way more than I ever thought I was. So they actually were the group that took me on my first backpacking trip. Um, we went to Conundrum Hot Springs in Aspen. And they taught me what to bring, how to eat, what food to pack. Um, and they did teach me how to deal with human waste without leaving a trace. Um, and after I learned all those how-tos, it was like, you know, the floodgates were open and all of these opportunities were available that I just never thought were going to be things that were in my life. Jax, I've got a follow-up question, but yeah. I, want you, I want you to predict if everything you just talked about, what's my follow-up question going to be about? Hmm. Maybe one of the books. I don't know. It's going to be about your dad. Your dad was oh, a okay. judge. He is. Yeah. He's, he still is curr he's currently a judge. He's trying to retire, but he really, he just keeps taking cases. Okay. And what, what kind of judge is he? Um, he started out as a family court judge when I was a teenager uh, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which was very exciting, you know, growing up with a dad who's dealing with just all sorts of horrible teenage stuff at his office. And he'd come home and I, you know, I had a super strict curfew at 9 PM and I had a small town. So if I left my boyfriend's house at like five minutes after nine, which consequently was when the credits of Malcolm in the middle stopped running, there would be a police car outside his house. Miss Ren, do you need a ride home? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Did he, did he ever use any of the cases that he, he, uh, he sat in judgment of as kind of um, morals? Uh, stories to, to learn by he was very professional so he kept work and home life separate uh -huh. um, in a literal sense but you could sometimes tell when he was very concerned about something like he would show just an undue amount of worry about you going to the mall to the arcade and it was like okay something has clearly happened for you <laughs> that is giving you concern about this let me just remind you I am your straight a ballet dancer student who's home every night by nine like it's gonna be fine yeah. So I was a high school principal. Oh yeah. I had my three kids eventually come to my high school and go through my high school. Mm. And so, you know, I tried to be professional, but I used, I used, I didn't name oh, yeah. names, but I used real life examples of, you know, why I encouraged them to do or not do the things that I did. So. I mean, we lived in our biggest fear was ending up in front of someone who knew our dad. So, you know, there was no way we were going to get caught, you know, underage drinking at a party, for example, because there, there was no anonymity and he was going to find out before anybody else did. So, yeah. All right. Very good. He, he was family law. Is he still family law? No, he's a senior judge right now. So he um, kind of gets to take his pick of which cases he takes um, just because he's past retirement age. Mm -hmm. He was the president judge for a while. He's been all over. He's been doing it for, gosh. He was elected when I was in middle school and I am old now. So yeah, it's been over 20 years. And you said there's that sense of judgment of being judged. Do you feel being, do you feel that he judges you for, you know, being involved with how to poop in the woods? My dad, I think we have had my entire adult life to come to an understanding. Um, I was a weird kid and I think he definitely worried about me. Um, just trying to figure out like, how is this child going to sit at a desk and, you know, work a nine to five and make a salary and survive in this world. And I think I've taken a path that he would not have envisioned for me, but I think um, he has a lot of respect for it. And I love it. It makes me so happy when he comes out to visit and I can give him a little taste of the lifestyle that we have out here. Um, because I think, you know, you can tell that he really, even though it's not necessarily what he would do, he loves it. And I think he's really happy that I get to do it. You give him a little taste of how to poop in the woods? Yeah, I took him on his first overnight last summer, actually. It was awesome. And I gave him a whole little, a whole poop kit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's great. 
it, let's take a, a couple of minutes and talk about your why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think, um, I guess for me, that first trip to Conundrum Hot Springs was a real eye opener. Like I, I thought, you know, it was my first time out in the wilderness. Right. And I thought I'm in this pristine, untouched wilderness, you know, humans have to walk back here, right? You can't take a car. You can't take like an RV. You got to walk back here. You got to sleep on the ground. You got to poop in a hole. Like it's a whole process. And I just, I thought that was incredible. And then we ran into a ranger who was up there with us. And this was years ago. Now you have to have a permit. It's a whole ordeal because it's become so crowded up there. But this was when it was really first starting to pick up in popularity. And so I met a ranger who was up there and their entire weekend, the whole point of them being up there was cleaning up human excrement that was just laying around in campsites. And that was a huge eye opener for me because I was like, this is beautiful wilderness. This is amazing. And it was like, no, this is actually a pretty frequented destination that's about as dirty as a truck stop restroom. And that was just, you know, for me to realize on my first trip out that these spaces are incredibly magical and wonderful and transformative, but they are also, you know, they're places that we need to take care of. And if we want to recreate in them, we also really have to take responsibility for maintaining them. You know, a lot of work goes into any trail, right? It's just the construction of the trail alone, maintaining it when there's erosion, much less, you know, the human impact on things. Um, campfires and human waste are huge. Um, and so for me, that was really a moment when I realized, like, if I want to do this, I need to also be involved in making sure that these spaces are still here for, for other people to enjoy, for me to enjoy 20 years down the road. Um, and that has just really kind of influenced everything I've done since then in the outdoors, whether it's you know, my website, um, because I, I didn't know how to poop in the woods. When I went on my first dispersed camping trip, we were going with some coworkers, and I, it felt really awkward to ask them that question. And, you know, it was, this was like, I don't know, 15 years ago before Instagram was really a thing. We didn't have like spandex clad influencers making, you know, super cute reels about how to do backcountry things. It was like, you can go into REI and ask somebody who's going to tell you, but they're going to make you feel kind of silly. You can buy a book and there is a really great book called How to Shit in the Woods, which I highly recommend. Um, or you can Google it and really hope that something comes up. So I figured if people, if I'm Googling, other people are Googling. So I'll make a place for them to land that's like friendly and approachable. Um, and, you know, hopefully helps them feel like they belong in the backcountry, even if they've never been there before. That's great. So from that first experience in Conundrum Hot Springs in Aspen, Colorado, yeah. a seed, a seed was planted in it the was. excrement and has uh, since sprouted. It and is so awesome. we're going we're gonna to explore that a little bit more in, in segment number two here. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear about uh, some of your trips, uh, that very first trip where you had to actually poop in the woods, and uh, we'll see how it went. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We were talking to Julia Wren, a.k.a. Jax, uh, creator, creator of How to Poop in the Woods. Yep. Do you have business cards to that effect? I don't. You should. I think I made a few once for an outdoor retailer show, and that was it. You pass them out at parties. There you go. You, you'd be the life of the party. Okay. So, Jax, what kind of trips do you take? So, I have never had the guts to not have a job. Um, so, I am full-time employed. Um, and so, and that works for me, actually. Um, I am really fortunate I work in tech, so I've been able to have jobs that have, um, like I've chosen places with zero to very small commutes. Um, I've pretty much established some concrete work-life boundaries so that I can, you know, work reasonable hours, and most of my jobs have unlimited PTO, and so I'm generally able to get away for anywhere from like a five-day backpacking trip to a 14-day backpacking trip, and that's, you know, let me see some really incredible places in Alaska and Canada and South America, um, of course, the American West, and we even got to hit um, uh, one of the great walks in New Zealand. You can do a lot in five to 14 days. I mean, you can you really a lot can. of ground and see a lot. Oh, yeah. So as, you, as you put it in the notes here, those are trips that are accessible to working stiffs. They are. I think one of your other guests said that. And I was like, yep, that is definitely the way that we try to set it up. Because yeah, I think I've talked, to, I've talked to a number of people who, you know, they, they work 
for a certain period of the year to save up money to do their trip. So they may work for four or five months, decide they have enough money, and then they're on the trail for five, six months. That's incredible. That takes a level of courage that I have never had. But I definitely find that like for me, consistency is a lot more important than intensity. So I really tried to make sure, I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. I live in an awesome town. We have a lot of interconnected open space, um, but it's been very important to me to set up my life so that, you know, I can go to a job that I enjoy from, I work seven to three most of the time, and then I can come home and just go for a hike right out my back door. Or, you know, on the weekends, I can pop up into the mountains and do an easy overnight, do a bunch of hikes. Um, and so, you know, enabling me to do that in my day to day has been a lot more sustainable for me than like taking, I would love to do a through hike, but it's hard for me to justify taking six months off to do that and then come back to a life that I don't love. Yes. Now you, you could do a shorter through hike, like the trans Catalina trail. Yeah, I would love, I have a number of shorter through hikes that are on my bucket list, actually. There you go. All right. And when you hike, do you go solo? Do you have a partner? that you regularly hike with or how does that work? That's a good question. Um, for most of my hiking, I don't know, career experience, um, I've been by myself, but with a group of friends. So I, you know, I was single when I first started backpacking, um, but I have a core group of three folks that I've gone with um, on almost every trip and we camp together and then just kind of do our own things during the day. Um, but now I've been fortunate enough to get my, my city boy husband into backpacking. And so for the last couple of trips, he has joined me and that's been a real blast actually. Nice. Now has, has a city boy picked up a trail name? He hasn't yet, but we should really work on that. Yeah. Let's, let's think of something. All right. He's so, an aerospace engineer. So I think I'd call him rocket man. Built in right there. It really right. is. So he's also go, quite fast. You can go from Rocket Man to Elton John. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was a ballerina, so we got Tiny Dancer. It's perfect. Oh, my. That, I mean, that just all came together real quick. We would joke that, you know, that should be enough to get Elton John to play at our wedding, but sadly, it is not. So is he your fiance or husband? He's my husband. Husband. So Elton John did not play at your wedding. No, no. The ship sailed on that one, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm, okay. Now we, we went down to, this is another side trip it has nothing to do with hiking, but, um, you, you brought it up. So okay. we, my wife and I took our three kids down to Cabo for our 50th, uh, 50th birthdays. So we oh, went wow. down to Cabo, spent some time down there and we went to Cabo Wabo, which is the, the bar owned by Sammy Hagar. Oh yeah. And they had a, a group, uh, I guess it was the house group there that, that played there. There was three guitarists. Each, each one had a different type of guitar. So you had acoustic, electric, and something else. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was bass or what. But their name was Cabo Uno. And they were fantastic. Yeah. They were so good. They were so good. that we went on like one of the first nights we were, we were down there. And we had to go back and see them again. So they, they, they were just really entertaining. And I, I said to my daughters at that time, I said, we're going to get them to play at your wedding. That's how good they are. I'm going to, I'm going to make them an offer right now. We need to have them up to California. We'll put them up. And when you guys get married, uh, they'll, they'll play at the wedding. So I love unfortunately it. I don't have any wedding dates as of yet. So I, I can't re- yet reach out to them, but we'll see. I love it. Some people are really jonesing for their kids to get married so they can have grandkids. You really just want to see the band. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, kid, grandkids, okay, but I, I really want to see Cabo Uno again. That's phenomenal. Oh, let's go. All right. So let's uh, let's let's take a let's go back to that Conundrum Hot Springs trip. Yeah. So I think that was your first your first overnight. It was my first overnight. Yep. And did they have like uh, porta potties out there or trail bathrooms? They did not. I honestly don't know if they have gotten some since, um, but I I would doubt it. Um, I, I will say some of my favorite overnights since then have had phenomenal, like the magical backcountry toilets where I, High Sierra Trail has my, probably my favorite at Hamilton Lakes. It just like yes. overlooks um, the Hamilton Gorge. It's phenomenal. You, and you're you've just, graced, you know, you've graced that throne as well. Their toilet. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I have pictures of it that are framed in our bathroom. I love it. We, we are kindred spirits now because your cheeks and my cheeks have touched the same, the same throne out there. Yes. 
In it's, fact, yeah. I'm going back this summer. We're doing we're doing High Sierra Trail here in less than a month. So I'm, I'm, I'm really so excited to, to, to get out there and, and uh, enjoy the views. That's awesome. That was my last trip and it's still, it's lodged real deep. Yes. All but right. no, I don't believe that they have any toilets there. You are on your own to dig a cat hole. Okay, so let's get to the heart of the matter here. And this is why people have tuned into this episode. They saw the title and said, let, let, let me hear about this. So this is your first trip. How did, how did you learn how to poop in the woods? Because I, I, you know, I'm pretty confident that for anybody out there who is maybe later in life, I'm not saying you're later in life. I'm talking about myself now. Um, that if, you know, if you're older and you're, you're, you're attempting this for the first time and you've got all the gear and you're planning, one of those, one of those questions, those nagging questions mm-hmm. in the back of your mind is at some point I'm going to have to poop out there. And mm-hmm. how, how does that work? I will. That's really what drew me to that specific topic for the website. Cause you know, for beginners, you can talk about gear, you can talk about trip planning, you can talk about all sorts of things, but really the thing that was, you know, catching up my coworkers or friends of mine and my family, folks who were very outdoorsy, otherwise, you know, were trail runners or like mountain bikers or did float trips, like folks who do things outside their big hurdle to getting into overnights was, well, what am I going to eat? And how do I poop out there? And they were genuinely very concerned about this. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where if you haven't done it before, it seems very daunting. But once you do it for the first time, you're like, oh, that's it. This is actually phenomenal. I should do it this way all the time. So it used to be that best practices with Leave No Trace um, were, you know, all about the cat hole. And that was what I learned when I was there. Um, I was very fortunate. I happened to go on my first backpacking trip with a woman who, um, she was an educator through the outdoor school for a long time before she moved to Colorado and became a middle school teacher. And so she was teaching um, middle school age, primarily girls, how to you know survive in the backcountry for their first trips out. And you know, you've got middle school kids, you were a, a principal, you know this, like kids will ask anything. They have absolutely no shame. And so she had a whole lesson that she would teach kids about creating poop soup. So when you dig your cat hole, you go to the bathroom in there and then you pour a bunch of water in and make a slurry and that helps it break down more easily. So she taught me about poop soup. We had a really fun like pooping yoga sesh where we played around with like different poses that you could do whilst going to the bathroom. My favorite is like the tree hang. (laughs) So, you know, she just made it a lot of fun. She made it not awkward. Um, And it it was phenomenal. Poop yoga. Yeah. Different different positions. You know, I only know the squat. So is there, a, what, what are the other positions? You have the tree hang. You've got the squat, the, the best, phenomenal, hands down, like easily the best option. And this is the one I taught my husband is you find a felled tree and you sit on it and hang your butt over it. Cause especially on high Sierra trail, when your quads are shot, you just, you don't want to be squatting. You don't want to try to do a wall sit on a tree. So if you find that fallen log, that is a good time. Perfect. You have to, you have to be strategic though. in, you in where, where you dig the hole. You do. You definitely, you have to work out like aim is a thing in that situation. Yes. Now with the tree hang, is there any, is there any, that's not the tree hang. That's the log sit, right? That's the log sit. The the tree hang is Uh probably my favorite one when I'm up in, you know, in an alpine area, because you don't really have like large trees to hide behind. You don't really have anything to do a wall sit on, but you can find a little guy that you can kind of hang on to and hang back off of as a counterbalance. But in those situations too, I spend a lot of time above tree line and I am very much, even for people who are below tree line these days, I am very much a proponent of the wag bag. Like cat holes are phenomenal if you have a place that isn't frequented very often. Um, but you know, human waste does not biodegrade overnight. And if you have spots, especially the places in the front range here in Colorado, they are so populated. Um, you know, you've got folks going up every day throughout the weekend, a lot of days in the summer throughout the week, there's just not enough time for all of that to decompose. So I'm a big fan. I I am a huge encourager of taking the wag bag and packing it out. It's a pretty crappy situation. It is. It's a pretty crappy situation, no matter how you cut it. Yeah. And maybe, maybe the pro tip, I'm going to steal your pro tip is that make sure that your, your hands don't have sunscreen on them when you're doing the the tree hang, because if if, if you (laughs) lose your grip, then you're really in trouble depending on where you are in the mm-hmm. process. You are in deep shit. Oh, yes, you went there. Very good. All right. What else can you tell us about how to poop in the woods? What other big lessons are, are there out there? Hmm. 
I mean, I think one of the the ones that was most interesting for me to learn as I started backpacking in different terrains was that you can't really follow the same rule everywhere you go. So for example, if you're in the sand, I, I was really confused the first time I camped in the sand dunes. I didn't really know what to do. Digging a cat hole is fine there as it turns out because the sand moves around so much just kind of slips down and, and you're fine. Um, but you know, if you're in a desert environment where you have the cryptobiotic soil, you can't do that. You've got to pack it out. And so I think, um, you know, just really understanding where you're going, being aware of water, making sure you're at least 200 feet from water, 200 feet from camp, um, just all of those, you know, pretty basic rules, um, but that you can find if you look online, if you're not familiar, um, you know, I, I think just an understanding of where you are. And thinking about the people who are coming after you and, and what you would want to find if you were in their shoes generally helps you keep from going astray. Okay. And have you ever had that experience that a lot of us had where you, you think that you're far enough off, off the trail and you're, you're oh. doing your business and you look up and realize, oh, the trail comes right by here and there are some some hikers right there. Hi, On hi, High Sierra doing? Trail. Uh-huh. It was my first thing in the morning. I had my coffee. I had a lovely view up the mountain and I was like, this is great. It was, um, oh, what is the name of that camp? It might be Crabtree Meadow. It's where it's the junction with the JMT and the High Sierra yes. Trail and possibly the PCT. Yes. Super busy. We hadn't really shared camp with anyone up to that point. So we just kind of been loosey goosey with where we were choosing to go to the bathroom um, and, you know, do anything else for that matter. And this was the first morning in a crowded camp. And I was just chilling there with my coffee and the view, just kind of taking it all in. And all of a sudden I heard a bunch of JMTers coming up the trail, maybe like 20 feet away from me. It was, it was really fun. So all you can do at that point is just wave, toast them with the coffee, have a good hike. What a great image. You kind of a little bleary eyed, you got your coffee with you, you got your toilet kit, you're in the squat and uh, just sipping your coffee and, oh, hey, yep. <laughs> how you doing? Yeah, sorry about that. One of my favorite moments like that was when I came face to face with a deer. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I heard some rustling and sure enough, right out of the, the undergrowth comes this deer and we stop. He stops about 10 feet from me. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him and he's like, uh, hey, man, what are you doing? I eat. I eat here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. That is my my perpetual fear is that I'll run into like a moose or a bear on like a midnight bathroom trip. But honestly, the only bear I've ever encountered was in Jackson after finishing Teton Crest Trail. And they were meandering around the porta potties and the dumpsters, which were right there at the cabins we were staying at at the very end. And so it was until I was back in civilization before I encountered a bear on a bathroom trip. Now, have you heard about the picnic? No, no. So in, in Jackson, uh, there is an antler arch in town, oh, yeah. right? Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. So the picnic is you start on bike on a bike from that antler arch. You ride up to Jenny Lake. Yes. You park your bike. You swim two miles across Jenny Lake, and then you hike up to the top of the Grand Teton. Oh yes. And then you turn around and you hike down. You swim back across the lake. You get on your bike and you ride back to the antler arch in Jackson. That's that's the picnic. That makes me so happy. It, it kind of goes with your adventure racing, right? It does. A, yeah. It's a little mini adventure race there. I am the worst swimmer and that is my goal for my knee rehab. I'm allowed to swim. And so I am determined that by the time I'm done rehabbing this thing, I'm going to become a swimmer and I'm going to be able to do a sprint try. So. Okay. You can well, check back in that, with me in nine months. <laughs> after you do, as you said, after you do that, you have to come back on and tell us about it. There you go. Okay. So tell us about the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island. Yeah, so West Coast Trail was my first uh, multi-day trip and it was it was absolutely incredible. I think, uh, you know, going into it, I had always wanted to be a through hiker and I, we spent what, I think it was five or six days out. So it was a very short trail, but it was the first time in my life that I had ever gone from, you know, from one end of something to the other and like set up, created a plan and done what I set out to do. And uh, it was something I never would have done on my own. I was actually at a very strange place in my life. Um, when I got the invitation, I, I did not plan the trip. I got the invitation from one of those friends who was on my ultimate Frisbee team. Um, and he just sent out a message to our running group and said, hey, I have four permits. Who wants to do this? Um, and at the time when I got the message from him, I was sitting in, I believe, a puddle of stale beer in a bar around 
two or three in the morning, it was about closing time on St. Patrick's Day with a bunch of friends. And I had just walked away, like I lobbed a grenade at the very lovely suburban life that my former partner and I had put together. We, you know, we had a house, we were on the track to get married. And I was like, this is not, it's not time for this. I don't know who I am as a person yet. I, I can't do this. So I kind of chucked a grenade at that, walked away and, you know, found myself on the floor of this bar, kind of trying to figure everything out. And I got his message and I was like, yeah, this sounds like something that would give my life some direction. So I replied immediately and said, yeah, I'll do it. And I think the hike was maybe in two months. And when I woke up the next morning, I was like, oh, what did you do? This is, this is not a great idea. Uh, but I immediately started training for it. And that, you know, gave me the structure that I, I needed really to, you know, make a pretty drastic U-turn in my life. And I got myself to an REI garage sale, got myself outfitted and, and off I went two months later to, to hike on West Coast Trail. And for anyone who's familiar with that, it's, it's an awesome trail, um, but it's, you know, a little bit challenging for someone who's from a mountain environment because it is on the West Coast of Canada and it is all, it, we joke that it's all roots and ladders. So it's known for it's like soul sucking mud and giant mosquitoes. And it has, I think over a hundred ladders that are up and down the faces of these cliffs that you descend every night to camp and then you climb up again in the morning. Um, and it was, you know, it was an incredible experience. Some of the best advice I got right before that trip was adventure is discomfort recounted at leisure. So every time we ran into a situation where you know, we were really frustrated or we were having, you know, some tension in our group dynamic or it was raining and I didn't have my, my trusty raincoat. I had some, you know, knockoff brand that leaked horribly. I just was like, well, this will make the story better when I get home. And, you know, I think with that attitude, it really helped me to enjoy what was a very challenging, but very rewarding trip. And, and basically, you know, opened the door to all the backpacking I've done since. Wow, what a segment right there. That, that, that stretch of conversation right there has so many twists and turns, nooks and crannies. I love it. You just defined type two adventure, by the way. Yeah. Adventure is discomfort recounted at leisure. Yeah. That's type two type fun. Type two fun is the best fun. That's right. That's right. But let's go back a little bit because I want to talk about this little existential crisis you had <laughs> in a bar on St. Patty's Day. And so what's, uh, I mean, most of us, most of us go through life and we, we just make our decisions and we go down this path and we, we don't question, we don't question, yeah, yeah. We, we, this is the way it's supposed to be. And it sounds like that you're, you're heading down a path and uh, metaphorically heading down a path and you came to that, that talking heads moment of, you know, what is my life? What is going on here? And you, you, it sounds like you threw it out the window. I did. I, I, like I said, I was a very cautious kid growing up and I was a very firm believer that I needed to, you know, go to a good college, get a good job right out of school, buy a house, you know, and have a functional life. Um, and that felt really, really important to me. And I never really asked myself why that felt so important. I never asked myself if that was what I wanted to do. Um, I just always assumed it was what I had to do. And I came to Colorado and I, you know, I started this journey with friends where, you know, I, I was learning, I was feeling a, a sense of empowerment and a sense of importance and self-worth. Um, and I was discovering that I was capable of doing all these things that I never thought that I could do. So I, that was one half of my life. And then on the other side, I was just still kind of blindly following down this path and building this life that I, you know, had never really checked in with myself to make sure that I wanted because I was so scared that I wouldn't be able to do it. Like I thought I would really have trouble getting a good job. And I, cause I, you know, I was kind of a weird kid. I struggled with ADD. Um, I was really whimsical. And so I thought like living that life is going to be something I really have to work for. And that in itself will be the accomplishment. And once I realized like, I, I can do that, I can do the normal life thing. Um, but I can also do all of these other things. And if I can do them, what else can I do? And, and, what do I actually want? Like what makes me feel like I'm alive and present in my life versus just kind of coasting along? Now, it sounds like you didn't let him down easy. You said in, in your words, you lobbed a grenade 
I did. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a pretty end to an almost 10 year relationship, but I am happy to say that that person is one of my best friends today. And so I, you know, we've found our way back to a happy, healthy relationship, which is wonderful. And you're not married to him. No, no, no. no. He's a, he's a friend, 10 year relationship. Yeah. Wow. We were college sweethearts and we moved out here together. Okay. So yeah. I guess, I guess Doc is lucky that Mrs. Doc never had one of those moments because we were high school sweethearts. Oh, nice. If, and if think... she, did, she did have one of those moments, she at least didn't lob a grenade. I think she just kept it to herself. Maybe, maybe cried in her pillow each night. I don't know. But No, uh, I think it's phenomenal when you have someone that you can grow up with and kind of find yourself with. And, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful that that person is back in my life because, you know, I've gotten to watch him go on to do things that you know, knowing who he was in college, I, I would have never thought that he would have been capable of doing. And I'm hoping that, you know, he's had the same experience watching me grow up. But I just think it was one of those situations where when you have someone who knows you so well, as a certain type of person, it can be really hard to break out of that. And so for me, I needed to just get rid of that in order to get rid of the crutch of, of who I was and figure out who I could be and who I wanted to be. Now, were you literally sitting in a puddle of beer? Oh, yeah. I was never a heavy drinker. So like two beers in and I was just like chilling on the floor of the bar. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh-huh. All right. Hey, let's let's put that in the review mirror now. Let's uh, there's so many interesting things I want to talk to you about, but I'm, I'm mindful of time here. Um, yeah. I have here wag bag experience on Mount Whitney. Mount yeah. Whitney. So you've been on top of Whitney. We did As we part of the out, High Sierra Trail. Part of the or, high Sierra Trail. Yeah. 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 We finished on Whitney mm -hmm. with apparently with my torn ACL, which I didn't know prior to that hike. Um, but I found out shortly after we got back. Wow. You're a badass. Thank you. You're going up to the top of Whitney on one ACL. Awesome. And so, what, uh, tell, tell us about the wag bag experience. Yeah. So my, my, my husband was with me on this trip. It was actually his first, uh, I think it was his first, no, it wasn't his first multi-day, but it, it was his first longer backpacking trip. Um, and so he, he had had all sorts of new experiences, including pooping outside for the first time. And for both of us, it was our first experience with a wag bag. Um, and so, you know, for us, it was, you know, fraught with a bit of nerves, um, but definitely it, there was never a moment when we were like, well, maybe we just don't do that. You know, like we never thought about, we'll just dig a hole or hide it under a rock or leave the wag bag there or anything like that. Like that would not have crossed our minds. Um, and I am in my other life, uh, my non-professional life, I volunteer as a forest service ranger. And so, you know, for me, being in the backcountry is kind of synonymous with cleaning up. So when I'm, when I'm up there, frequently what I'm doing is carrying a dirty bag and chucking um, the little dog poop bags that are along the side of the trail into the dirty bag. And so, you know, the wag bag wasn't that different. I had a large dirty bag that I popped on the back of my backpack, put the whole group's wag bags in there and started carrying them down on the very last day of our trip. Um, and as we descended from trail camp, throughout trail camp, it was really interesting because you had to be particularly careful to avoid the human poop grenades but then as we were hiking down, I was really quite shocked actually by the number of wag bags that were just hanging out along the side of the trail. And I'm not sure if it was people heading up, leaving them there, planning to grab them on the way down or, you know, deciding that they were too obnoxious to carry on the way down or what it was. But, you know, just from kind of a, a reflex, I picked them up and threw them in <laughs> into my dirty bag. And my poor husband, this is like the height of COVID. And we're not really sure how it's transmitted yet. And, you know, he's kind of a germaphobe anyway. So he was just appalled that I just kept picking up these bags of other people's poop and throwing them into my wag bag. But it was another one of those situations where it's like, you know, coming to Whitney and climbing Whitney, whether you're doing it in a day or you're doing it as part of a backpacking trip, that is not a small commitment. These are people who, you know, ostensibly spend time in the outdoors, who are fit, who are, you know, aware of what they're getting into. And even in those environments, we're finding folks who are, you know, leaving bags of human waste, like trash bags of human waste along the side of the trail. Um, it was just, you know, it was a really impactful moment for me, I think, in the string of them, where it was just a reminder that, you know, even folks who love the outdoors, you cannot take for granted 
um, that they're really in those moments when you're exhausted and in those moments when you're, you're filthy and you don't want something smelly in your backpack, like you can't take for granted that everyone is thinking if everyone does exactly what I do, what will happen to this resource? You know what I love about this episode, Jax, is that the most common words used so far uh -huh. in this episode is, is our poop and grenades. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure what to make of that, but it's awesome. <laughs> there you go. And so where do you do your forest service uh, ranger duty? So I work in Indian Peaks and James Peak Wilderness areas, um, and they're along the front range of the Rockies in, uh, in Colorado. Okay. So next year, when our listeners get out there and uh, get out to Indian Peaks and James Peak Wilderness, James Peaks Wilderness, they can, uh, they can look for jacks out there carrying the wag yes, bag. Indeed. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I'll be the one with all the dog poop. Nice. Let's, let's take a few minutes. Let's talk about your website, How to Poop in the Woods. What can people find on your website? And what is the website address? Um, the website address is howtopoopinthewoods.com, which was kind of shocking to me when I found that it was available. Um, and they can basically find advice if you are, you know, interested in getting into the backcountry, but you've never really made that jump from like car camping or day hiking into, you know, even dispersed camping or backpacking. Um, you can find advice that feels like it comes from your friend. Um, you know, I think a lot of sources are, you know, these folks, especially now with the prevalence of, you know, van life and, and digital nomads, like there are a lot of people who are doing this and who are really good at it, um, but who can, I think, approach giving some of that really basic advice with a little bit of condescension, because it, it is, you know, for if you've done it more than once, it feels very obvious. Um, but, you know, I think I was so conscious of how awkward it was for me at the beginning, asking about these things. And, you know, the fact that every time I hike somewhere different, I'm learning new things. If I hike on the East Coast, you know, if I, I'd love to do the Appalachian Trail, because that's where I started hiking. Um, but I'm going to have to learn a whole new set of leaves to avoid, for example. <laughs> so, because, yeah, there's just, there's a whole different array of wildlife there than there is here. Um, so we're always learning. And so I try to really make sure that the tone on the site is approachable. It's fun. It's generally very self-deprecating because I will share experiences, you know, of horrible mistakes that I've made in hopes that it helps other people avoid doing the same thing. Um, and yeah, there's info, there's how to's um, from there's your basic how to poop in the woods, how to poop in extreme environments, how to extinguish a campfire, um, which is especially important here, how to bear proof your site, avoid needing an air evac, like all sorts of, you know, the crucial stuff. Um, there's a gear guide. So anything, you know, that we talk about on here and everything that's in my backpack, I've got reviews on there. Um, there's a trail journal with some stories about hikes that I've hiked, and I'm trying to update it with some local hikes that we've been doing now that, now that I'm a little incapacitated. Um, and then I've got a lifestyle section with like dehydrator recipes, because I'm a big fan of making my own food. Um, reading lists, random health and fitness stuff. So all sorts of goodies. Yeah, my family has threatened to get me a dehydrator for Father's Day. But it like, is a slippery that's, slope. That's, like that's some kind of a threat. I'm like, bring it on. Let's do it. It's yeah. wonderful. Let's yeah. give it a shot. Now you mentioned having to find, uh, do, do your research on different kinds of leaves. Do you not use any kind of toilet paper? Are you using like natural leaves to, when you do your business? It really depends. Um, I do use toilet paper and I always pack it out. Don't burn it. Don't bury it. Take it with you. Um, I but I, I who, would, who would burn it? I mean, that, that, who wants to put that in the air as you're breathing? Yeah, that wouldn't have occurred to me, but I have friends who are very into it. And actually when I was in hiking in Torres del Paine in Chile, um, there's a huge swath of damage from a forest fire that apparently started from someone burning toilet paper. So it happens, okay. um, but I'm a big fan of like the water bottle bidet. So I, I try to use that now versus toilet paper. Yes, we've, we've had a few people come on the podcast and swear by the water bottle. Yeah. Bidet. And then uh, if you're trail running, yeah, I don't carry toilet paper when I'm trail running. So at that point, there's, you know, there's a whole list of things that you could maybe try before you go the sock route. Nice. And now I, I will probably get some hate mail if I don't ask this next question. They're like, Doc, why didn't you ask this question? She alluded to it. Why, why wouldn't you follow up on it? So oh boy. I'm going to ask the question. Uh, do you have a, a worst case scenario poop story, personal poop story out there? You said oh, you, you, you kind of learned from the experience out there. Yeah. Yeah. It was trail running. It wasn't back. It's always oh. trail running. Right. Cause when you're mm -hmm. backpacking, you have literally everything you need with yeah. you. You could basically, yeah, just like go live out there. 
Um, but trail running, I always inevitably take like a tiny little backpack right before work. We've got this lovely mountain, Mount Sanitas, right next to Boulder. So it's like a perfect jaunt up there before work, but it is very rocky. Uh, my favorite ascent is up this ridge line that just doesn't really have any space for you to kind of pop off of. And it's morning, right? So you've chugged your coffee on the way there. You're running down. You're jostling yourself. It's terrible. And so, you know, inevitably you have to pop off and do your business. And I don't have tissues. I don't have, I've got nothing. And there's, you know, a bunch of like crusty forest, like nasty fall leaves. Um, it was awful. So in that case, I'm all about like a rock. <laughs> a nice smooth stone. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody who was running the mountain that morning saw me. They had a full moon hike at 7 a.m. What can you do? I mean, yep. nature calls and nature is insistent with its call mm -hmm. sometimes. Yep. Yep. I just, I feel really lucky. I always feel for runners, especially runners who are training for, you know, these crazy distances who are running in the suburbs, because I genuinely don't know what you do. Like I'm, I'm on trails, right? I can, pretty much figure out a solution but these folks who are in suburban neighborhoods i don't know what you do in that scenario you know the, the, this has reminded me of a story that was in the news probably uh -huh. three four years ago we had someone in colorado springs yeah was he a principal no no I think, uh, the story i'm thinking of there, there somebody was was i think pooping on the high school track oh yeah and we've had that happen. We've had people poop in front yards. They were trying to figure out who it was. It would happen. It would happen repeatedly, and they finally caught the guy. It turned out it was the high school principal. Oh no! Yeah. Well, yeah but like, buddy, don't you have keys to the school? Exactly. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. I get it. If you're, you know, you're a runner, you're there before anything opens up. Like, I think after the first time, maybe you start bringing a baggie. You know, even if you've just got a doggy bag, like something. Mm -hmm. But you know. I get it. If it's, if you're new to it or like, it's one of your first runs and that happens, you're like, hmm, I don't, I like, I don't know what the alternative is. You know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to, I'm going to start packing doggy bags in my, uh, my hydration. I just take my dog's bags. Yeah. Because yeah. in the event that you can't dig a hole somewhere, you might as well just go that route. Mm -hmm. Go hide under a bridge somewhere and <laughs> take care of business. All right. Very good. Hey, what's next for Julie? I mean, you are, you're recuperating right now, but what is the next uh, big adventure for you? So I have been loving, yeah, I, I'm doing a lot of kayaking right now and teaching my puppy how to walk on a leash in hopes of making him a backpacking dog someday. I'm shredding the stationary bike in the basement. <laughs> um, and so I, my hope is that once I'm cleared to ride a real bike, um, I'll be able to start training for a triathlon. I think, um, you know, I'd be a much more confident person on the water if I were a, a better swimmer, for example. Um, so I'd love to do that. And instead of patrols this summer, Ranger Julia is going to be hanging out at the trailhead, giving talks on fire safety and um, pet safety in the wilderness, for example, keeping your dog safe when there's moose about. Um, and then as my knee heals, I'm really looking forward to figuring out how to juggle starting a family with this dream that I have of hiking some of the like longer, short trails. Um, I would love to do the Colorado Trail. I'd love to do Wonderland, John Muir. Um, and I, I, you know, I think section hiking the Colorado trail with a family is definitely something we could do. Um, we've looked at the Oregon coast trail, which is also another one that I think you could very easily do with a family because you're popping into towns at night. Um, so that is going to be hopefully the next chapter, how to change diapers in the woods. <laughs> nice. And a little subsection on your website. Yeah. You have some epic times in front of you, Jax. I, I, I am envious. This is going to be fantastic. Thank you. All right. Hey, Jax, you know where we are? Where? The pro tip insight of the week. Yes, that's right, Half Calf. It's time for, for Jax to share some trail wisdom with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better. What do you have for us? And is it, dare I, dare I ask, is it poop related? This is not poop related, actually. I mean, I guess it could be, but only very tangentially. So I think my piece of advice would be to never assume that someone is going to be able to bail you out. And that is very helpful advice that I received from actually one of the Rangers in Boulder. Um, and I was grateful for that because I think we have so many, you know, we've got cell service on so many trails. Now I called my grandma on top of Mount Whitney, like that's crazy. Um, and we have, uh, you know, spot devices and I have my inReach. Um, so we, we think that we're connected and we think that help is just a button press away, but you know, really it can be hours. It can be days before someone gets to you. 
Um, and I, I so frequently, whether I'm, you know, trail running like on my own or when I'm out as a ranger, I run into so many people who want to know, like, what is my proximity to my destination? Am I on the right trail? Have I started at the right place? Um, and, you know, backpackers who are asking, like, is this the trailhead that gets me to where I want to camp? And it's like, whoa, buddy, I, I really hope you can answer that question. <laughs> We're looking at a map. Can you tell me? Um, and, you know, folks want to know, like, is there something interesting nearby? How, how long does it take me to get there? Um, and I love that people are discovering, new people are discovering how fulfilling the outdoors can be. But it's also really critical that we're taking responsibility for ourselves. We're learning to read a map and not just the one in all trails. We understand the terrain that we're going to be on and we dress accordingly um, and have a plan for how to get yourself out of trouble. Because, you know, rescue crews, it's going to take them at least as long as it took you to get there. And in a lot of cases, it takes a lot longer because these crews are volunteers. They have a lot of equipment that they're carrying in. And, you know, if you're in a really, not even that remote, if you're, if you're a couple hours in, you could be there overnight for something as simple as a sprained ankle. Um, and so, you know, making sure that you have a plan for dealing with the most immediate problems. If you're in a situation where you get hurt or someone in your group gets hurt, you can prevent sunscreen, you can stop bleeding. Um, you have a way to let rescuers know where you are. And then you maybe have some options for longer term needs like food, shelter, water. Um, it just can really help you go from, you know, being in a really dire, bad situation to just having kind of a fun story for a podcast later on. One of the best pro tips ever from the chief expiratory officer of how to poop in the woods. That was, that was epic. Thank you very much. Of course. So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Julia. I want to thank her for joining us this week. Jax, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your latest adventures? So I'm on Instagram. Um, I admittedly don't post very frequently right now because I'm not hiking very much right now. Um, but I would anticipate that as summer gets going, as we start to get more trail reports in, in particular uh, from Indian Peaks, you'll start to see more advice on there, more tips about how to avoid things like bears, you know, in your tent, eating your food when you get back from a hike. That's a frequent one that we hear about. And so, uh, you know, there will definitely be pointers on there about things like that. And then um, the website, howtopoopinthewoods.com. It's probably the most comprehensive spot. Okay. Remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakingmirror at gmail.com. The Adventure Media Recommendation. Julie, I'm also looking at you to share a recommendation for a book, movie, documentary, some kind of adventure media to keep our listeners connected to the outdoors. We're calling this the adventure media recommendation. What do you have for us? Yeah. So I'm going to share with you um, the author that I'm reading right now. She's my favorite. She's my go-to. I reread her books constantly. Um, her name is Anna McNuff. She's British. Um, and she's just a badass chick who gets out there and does whatever she wants. She, uh, she did a run across the Tiara Roa Trail in New Zealand and wrote about it in this great book called Pants of Perspective. She cycled through um, all 50 states in the U.S. And I think that book is called um, United States of Adventure. And she, I'm, the one I'm reading right now is called Llama Drama. It's about her trip um, cycling through the Andes um, all the way from, you know, the northern end to the southern tip of South America. She just thought she's hilarious. She's very blunt, very straightforward. Um, she does all of her own narrations for the audiobooks, which I cannot recommend enough. Um, and, you know, she's just one of those people who is absolutely fearless. If she dreams it, she believes she can do it and she figures out a way. And that's just a constant source of inspiration for me. Anna McNuff? Yep. Okay. If I drop your name, do you think she'll come on the podcast? Are you guys friends? Highly doubt it. <laughs> I'm going to start a full court press to try and get her on the, on the pod. She sounds like- There a, you go. A She'd be a phenomenal guest. Okay. All right. And if I get her on, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll drop your name on, on there the you go. that you were the inspiration to get her on. Love it. Okay. What have we not asked you? Okay. Half calf with that incredible accent. You know, half calf is not English, believe it or not. She's, she's actually Southern California born and bred. I know she's my daughter. So uh, she puts on airs <laughs> trying to, trying to sound sophisticated. Um, before we wrap things up, I've got one more segment for you called What Have I Not Asked You That You're Dying to Tell Us About? What did we miss tonight? I don't know. I thought originally that it might be about how to poop in the woods, but we covered that. 
I think you're great. We did a pretty comprehensive job. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that is a wrap from the John Freaking Moore studio. Any shout outs to friends and family? Sure. Yeah. I'd love to give a shout out to team expired chicken salad sandwich. That's my ultimate Frisbee and running team um, without whom I would not be really anywhere interesting. Um, my husband, Nathan, and then my dad, I'm really hoping I can get him out on another overnight here soon. What was that team name again? Expired chicken Expired salad chicken sandwich. Salad sandwich. Uh huh. Oh my, that will make you poop in the woods. It will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> thank you for tuning in always remember the trail is the trail it doesn't care if you want to go downhill it doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite it doesn't even care if you're out of out of wag bags and you're looking to make some poop soup the trail is the trail embrace the sock